Welcome to a series of podcasts created by the Experimental Film and Media Arts class at Universität de Künste in Berlin of Professor Nina Fischer in collaboration with curator Vanina Saracino and artist Lili Kuschel. The program brings together artists, scientists, curators and experts from other fields who inspired us to observe and reflect upon our surroundings, our surroundings in, a in a critical way. way. We inquire into new forms of research and artistic strategies and we are interested in a conscious shift of perspective. Perspectives that take a distance from anthropocentric world viewings and, and binary, binary thinking, thinking in a favor of a tentacular one. We share images, sounds, sounds experiments, experiments, moments, moments anecdotes, anecdotes and videos, videos and thoughts that enable us to expand our sensing and understanding of a world within, within a more than, than human dimension. dimension. Guys, hello. Thank you very much for being, uh, coming to the first, uh, our first outdoor class. We finally managed it. I told you that this is the first time that we, yes. that we see each other as well. And uh, I have actually seen, not seen uh, Duki for a while, and I'm very happy to, to have you here at the, yes, at the class with you. us. Uh, Duki is an artist born in uh, Korea and raised in Germany. And she took part, she did the Weissense Hochschule, actually, right? Yeah. And uh, later on, she took part in the Olafur Eliasson's uh, uh, Institute for Raum Experimenten here, with the, where she got her, grad, where her master's degree. And uh, you're going to tell us a lot today about uh, your work without using screens. Yes, which I like very much. <laughs> Because, yeah, like the last months and the last year was a lot of like digital and computer and streaming and radio shows, TV shows, so everything becomes like so separated from where actually we are. And I think um, art or like, um, what do you say, the connection between art and um, or the relationship between art, the viewers, the environment has to be in touch and not be separated. So I think this is a really nice um, setup now to be here in Tempelhof where I used to live, just opposite here. So I've been here actually every day with my dog. So I know this place pretty well, yes. Before the, I lived here when the um, airport was still open. So there was still like the planes going, flying over my balcony. So, uh, and now it's this crazy park. Huh? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Are you I'm, I'm Duki and I'm an artist, so I like to be tentacular and work in many fields of like, I would say not food, but like uh, with um, yeah, ecology and their relationship, which uh, everything is included. So basically I do somehow everything at the same time just to make a sense of what I'm thinking of and I met Vanina a few years ago at, in Jerusalem. At the airport, I think, yes. when they were the dismantling airport, your yes. crab, right? <laughs> and they, they completely destroyed my artwork. So I'm working a lot with um, artificial stupidity, so I'm making these robots who have uh, a meaning but they doesn't make any sense at all. So it's really like you think, what are you doing? And then these uh, stupid uh, security guys in, in, in Israel, they, and I already knew it, it would be a disaster. I already had weeks before I had anxiety, and I called the curator, I talked to her. I'm not sure if I should really bring the robot. I think it will be a bomb, and they're gonna <laughs> close me up, and um, I will never get out of Israel. No, no, it's gonna be all fire, muscle tough, and blah, blah. Blah, blah. And then, of, co of course, Mazel Tov. So I took this case with me and they took me out of the uh, into security uh, chamber. They uh, investigated me for hours. It's like, what the fuck? Hey, you guys, you know me. It's like, uh, there is like a registered and it's, it's an artwork. I got invited through this um, institution. And yeah, and I think they even walked over my case because they're like still like footprints on top of the case and there's a huge crack and I don't know what they did with this uh, robot uh, 
So where all threads were broken, there was ketchup in it. I mean, I think maybe ketchup. they had their <laughs> lunch, <laughs> lunch on it. Yes, and I was like, no. what the fuck? Yes. yes, so this is what I'm doing. And this is how we met. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, normally I would start with the image and I guess this is the first image. So we are here outside, but not into the wild. So it's a very like human made construction, old former airport with a lot of like, I guess, toxic soil as well. And uh, it's a pity you guys couldn't go and see the show we had at um, Floating University. And um, because this is like the old former rain basin of the airport. So it's a, it became like a natural swamp. And uh, where the, um, I don't know how you say, grass, the, the reed. It's growing, there's a lot of like frogs and crows and birds and it looks like a bit of like, uh, how would I say, uh, like a utopian landscape because they also started like, uh, it was a uh, Raumlabor who started um, doing, building up these structures out of wood and it looks kind of futuristic, hippieistic and uh, yeah, also a bit rough, and we had this uh, show there called Terrestrial Assemblage, and we had to close it, unfortunately. But this is like all things uh, which yeah, you would have really liked to see and to experience. There was Marco Barotti who had uh, who made this big egg and um, produced it, um, the sound of uh, the population of every human being who's living and dying, but I didn't really get the entire concept of his work, but it, it looked great and it sounded great. So. <laughs> I wasn't there when I went there. Uh, yeah, there was like, nature no, has its unexpected, uh, yeah. You know, they're preparing actually an exhibition in public space, or we're starting to think about the possibility of using public space also because of, uh, of the pandemic restrictions. Yeah. And that would have been an amazing um, example also to understand what are the problems that you can deal with when you work with public space and yeah. all the unexpected. Because it's... Right. Uh, right, when you work with a, with a white cube, in a white cube, everything is more or less prepared. Not more or less. Everything is prepared for you to show our artwork. When you decide to work outside, you can you get oh, any yeah. kind of. Uh, it's horrible. Right? No, it's not horrible. <laughs> but there are also some some positive aspects to it. But your work was flooded, for example, when I when I arrived. Uh, yeah, I mean, my I what I did was uh, I made a pond inside a pond. So I made a pond inside the swamp, uh, and I uh, restored this old former skateboard slide. So it looked really cool. I um, think you can, you can see it on the website of Terrestrial Assemblage from the drone footage. And uh, I colored the, my pond uh, into this kind of green painting. It's basically well known. So you use ura, uranin, it's called, and it's a watermark um, biological substance, which is, um, yeah, uh, how, how you say, unbedenklich, um, so it doesn't cause any damage to, to nature. And then I put my artificial crab in it, the stupidity crab, who is um, basically made for cleaning up the oceans. I had these ideas uh, many years before, so you experienced the robotic crab I made in Israel, they damaged it. And then I made the other one, which um, took me quite a while to, to maintain it, how it was and how it is now. And I put it inside the water and there's this uh, remote control, so you basically can use and uh, drive and uh, play with this crap inside this water and like make the little traces with the green... Um, color and then it looks really like futuristic like in a sci-fi movie especially on the pictures and 
on the side I had this huge banner I drew four to six big painting I drew uh, when the pandemic started last year so there is a lot of like riots on to see if you look into it very close yes mm, yeah and the artificial stupidity series um, I made like I started with it actually from the beginning of like yeah my how should I say um, I always made things uh, even like when I was a child so I started like um, making experiments with um, batteries and magnets and uh, the most exciting part of my life was that I grew up on a, a construction site. So my father had a big construction company and there were all these yeah, huge yeah, machines and cranes, like really the big cranes. And I was like climbing up the crane. I was driving the crane. I, in the morning, uh, Sunday morning, I started uh, driving around with the truck of my of my dad and my mom was like get out of this car <laughs> and so I already started having this kind of like relationship between yeah machines but also nature so we had a lot of um, animals horses chickens I uh, I had a I had a bird I had a crow which uh, I found and she stayed with me and we were like best friends and I was like bit like Pippi Langstock in, in, in the southwest of Germany and I started like making my own ponds and this was already yeah the start of being me being an artist or I, I think like being an artist or what you do is always a part of yourself so you cannot just disconnect from what you're doing this is also a very difficult part because you're like 24 hours in your brain and um yeah, it's it's like it's a part of you. So this is like how my my work started to evolve during my years. And um, in Weissensee, I uh, started doing this little kinetic sculptures. And uh, at that time, I still did it myself, blowing up the school because I used. Um, like electricity which I shouldn't have used it and um, so I started to learn by also making mistakes and like um, started also making troubles in the universities <laughs> and um, yeah and this was actually a really great uh, time I had in Weissensee because the students they actually didn't use the, uh, the ateliers the studios I don't know why so I had like this entire gips ecke for myself with Shira together. You know Shira? Yes. Yeah. So we started together um, at the sculpture department and we just like worked and experimented like crazy, which was really great. And then, but then unfortunately, uh, professors changed and I went uh, to the uh, to the UDK, to Olafur's um, uh, what was it called? Uh, uh, Institute für Raumexperiment. <laughs> genau. <laughs> yes, and then I changed, and it was a completely uh, interruption of of being me and being all of a sudden in this kind of very clean space. Um, we were at the beginning, we were nine students, and. Um, and it was so sterilized that I was just like sitting there. I was like, what should I do here? I mean, I'm, I'm in a completely wrong space. And where are the experiments? But uh, so I really didn't like it. And because I'm also a chef and he uh, had or he has still the kitchen in his studio, I somehow managed to to sneak in and became a chef of the studio <laughs> downstairs. Yeah, yeah. So for a few years and instead of being 
upstairs in the institute, I was downstairs in the studio, was cooking for the entire crew, which I really enjoyed it. And yeah, I mean, in in uh, looking back to what they offered us was a lot, but it was so much for me that I still I, I think I still didn't digest it <laughs> until now. So there was a lot of lectures, there was a lot of um, talks and walks. So it was very theoretical input, which is great, but like the the part where you could be yourself and doing things was very limited because just like also because of the studio situation because everything was so clean I was like I cannot make any dirt I cannot make any any um, noise I yeah I felt really like that and um, yeah so I was mostly downstairs until I made my uh, my my master and uh, I left and um, but because I was a chef or I'm still a chef and I'm really interested into food and, as I said, in ecology. I was thinking of how can I basically, basically combine all my interests of, of yeah, being a chef, uh, loving food, but also the politics of food. But yes, yeah. you were saying, about yeah. all these many roles that you have in your life. Yeah, so many roles <laughs> in my life. I started actually um, studying art quite late, so that's why my history of doing all these things before, of um, yeah, being a chef, um, I'm a therapist as well, I'm a diver as well. Um, so these were my main interests, and I just like started to... To merge them together so what I'm doing now is actually all of except being a therapist just like in my free time when someone approaches me and stuff it's like I'm going away then. <laughs> but uh, I started like to um, to co combine my interests and one of my main work which became weirdly um, a really uh, well-known part is into the wild and this is like this big, uh, it can start from 3 to 65 to 75 to 100 meter long table landscape where I started to uh, build up and to plant all kinds of um, edible plants. And I always activate then the table with a last performance which becomes a dinner where I represent a menu for the last time was for Gropius Bau, so I created this menu for dark ecologists because the topic for them was down to earth, so everything was without electricity, everyone should be more um, aware of what they use on their carbon footprint and etc. etc. So I made this uh, menu for um, a recipe for Bruno Latour, recipe for um, who was it? Uh, Hito Steyerl, recipe for um, Paul Stamets, and recipe for uh, Donna Haraway. So it was a four course menu. And then um, the methods were that, of course, like Hito Steyerl was like um, the pyromanic algorithm that with this started like um, the world going crazy, going on fire. This was like the first labor when fire even started, like in. in back in ancient times. This is like when yeah, our world started to basically slowly, slowly evolve into what is now. Or like Paul Stamet was, um, was like a mushroom falafel I made with the wild herb pesto, which was collected from the table and um, some pickles and this was like the six ways of how mushrooms can save the world because mushrooms have like this incredible um, um, what do you say um, notion of yeah of purifying of cleaning of detoxifying things uh, it's also like my good friend maybe you heard of her, Jay Rimley, 
who made the mushroom suit. Um, so if you're dying, if you're dead, uh, you get this mushroom suit, and then the mushroom suit decompose your body because when you basically die there's a lot of toxics going inside the soil so it's like it's the worst thing ever so and uh, these things and then of course Donna Haraway was a matcha ice cream on the on schnapps and it was like the cyborg manifesto and this is like the way how I create this uh, menus and for Riga I made a completely different menu where I started like to gather all like the indigenous food in, in Riga in Latvia and, uh, this was also like an experience uh, they're really like resistic there I have to say <laughs> and um, they didn't even want to sell me cabbage you know it's like no you don't get the cabbage I was like okay <laughs> keep it bye why not it's like, it's like uh, I don't know, it's like Latvian, uh, some market women who have like, they still maybe live in the Soviet times, I don't know. It's like, uh, it's also like really, um, how would I say, yeah, I mean, the war or like the, um, the openness start like in 91 or yeah. something like that, 91. I guess. So this is still like you feel the communism there quite a bit. And it was for me also really like a challenge situation to create this into the wild for um, 250 people. And I had to, um, had to find like a gardener who started like doing the tablecloth I had to uh, I, um, collaborate with Andre he has the herbarium in Leipzig and he's a gardener but he also like had this permaculture farm and he brought for instance he brought all the plants from Leipzig to Latvia because it was not a which is also not very like CO2 friendly at the end um, but because it was not um, possible to get um, these plants from, from, from Latvia, even you think it's everything, there's forest and wood, they even wanted to use like a plastic uh, tablecloth to grow the, the grass on top. You know, there's all these kind of weird uh, situations you go through. And then in Buenos Aires, in Riga, uh, in, in, in Argentina, we went to Misiones and uh, this is, in the last bits of the rainforest where we did this big research about all medical plants there and and, um, and then we took this plant back to Buenos Aires and we uh, started to to make this table out of all these plants. So, so Into the Wild is basically based on always a big research part so in every region I'm doing it. Um, there is yeah, this really in-depth um, going looking into history, going looking into soil and uh, on food history, on the politics of, of that. And then at the end, what you see on the table is basically the outcome of the research. For instance, now I'm invited to do it in Sweden in Gotland, which is a little island and in Gotland it's quite dry and um, they have a big issue on on yeah on the water itself because there's no there's no rain. It's too dry that things can grow and we face the situation already. Last year it was really hot and dry in, in, in May. I don't know if you can remember and uh, so the plants, they, they, yeah, was was not a good season for for growing vegetables and stuff. And um, or in Las Vegas, they have to also. There is like this water politics that you cannot just like have a a, a meadow or like a vegetable garden. You can only have cactus there, <laughs> like like plants which are not using a lot of water and they have a certain time when they can use water and when not and then they have to also like collect the water from from the rain which makes sense to do that and 
so and now in Sweden I have this challenge of like there's a natural reservoir and um, the other challenge is also I'm here in Berlin so I have to delegate everything um, to Zoom no? and I have to make instructions of how to make the table and then also have to come up with the concept of how it will look like but even I wasn't there so everything goes through this kind of uh, yeah, long talks and um, looking on maps, having getting pictures from this area, but I cannot experience it myself. But then I thought, okay, why not making that time a, a table for non-humans? So I will create a table for for insects, for mushrooms, for swarms, for mosquitoes, and for um, other little creatures and um, and also this time the menu will not be for humans it will be for for all these um, animals and insects basically and so this is then one part but then okay and you come up with this okay now I create this table for for, for these animals but then how can I um, share it with other, um, yeah, other humans, or that they can have a better approach to to um, this abundance of, of nature, or how to make um, like kinship is like a very yeah nah, well known word, no? <laughs> but um, to that we basically get reconnected to what was always there, and then I thought, okay, and then the other part will be that I will film this whole process of building up the table then they have the feast there's like this long uh, time lapse where you see when the animals the birds the insects blah 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 and so weiter they come and they have this um, yeah this uh, meeting point and then it could be also become yeah, something something different than Into the Wild uh, was before. So it's always changing. It's Into the Wild is is a project which seems to be maybe very settled, but it's always changing. And every ingredient which is on the table is um, very um, researched about it. So it's it's a super long process and then also like the cooking part and um, harvesting the the food making the pesto from the wildlife um, situation uh, foraging it takes time to do it so it's 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 a very uh, um, yeah well investigated artwork or project to um, to let the yeah, the, the people basically uh, investigate it by themselves, by just like also touching, by smelling, by experiencing it. So it's, it doesn't need to, that I have to tell them, okay, this is like this and that and why you should and blah. It's just like everyone is always so amazed by eating everything by their hands and then um, they start having their own conversation about this, or do you know this plant or what this tastes really disgusting what is this and that and um, and then you can basically experience all these plants which are uh, mostly edible sometimes are not <laughs> <laughs> but the risk to get that is really rare <laughs> and um, yeah so you become basically a, a goat on, on a very wide field so you become something else than just being human. And then uh, from that, the other um, big part is this um, artificial stupidity series I'm doing. These robots I create, and they also like, they made so much, yeah. It's like having one child after another child, and they're doing all these kind of stupid things. And it's like, oh my God, why are you doing that? And then. And then, yeah, they they all have a personality at the end, and it's like. How many have you done? Uh, and they're all active. They're all active, yeah. 
for instance, I made a teapot. Uh, the teapot is called Goethe. Yeah, it's a big, <laughs> big one, and um, so it also goes in um, circulars. And he starts like to run very slow, then he walks around, and uh, especially in in when the light is off, uh, you can see it very well. Then all of a sudden, the light goes on, and underneath the bottom of the teapot and you see all the wires as, as like a shadow play then he starts like to run like crazy and, and then the um, lid starts to um, to, to shake and, you clap it, bop, 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 and then the steam comes out of the uh, what do you say the the heck um, the, the tea Brussel Kanneneche wie heißt das um, thank you was? <laughs> nee, nicht der Top. Um, where you pour the tea out. The, yes, this is yes. <laughs> And then there's the steam coming out. And Goethe is basically in um, in Asia. They uh, have this philosophy of wind and um, climate change is represented by uh, a tea pot, tea kettle. Because the moment you start the, uh, putting the tea kettle on, it starts like to evolve. When you it's, when the steam comes up until it starts to boil, and then at the Senate it goes crazy. This is also like with our weather, where we have like um, there's a sunshine, and then all of a sudden the clouds appear, and then from the clouds you have like little rain and then from the rain you have strong rain and the big wind comes and then you have the like the hot water is basically then the tornado which appears over the ocean and this is Goethe basically so he or they or it or whatever represents the, the climate yeah. it's one of the artificial stupidities here so it has a meaning but uh, yeah when you when you see it, it's like really like start to laugh about it. And this is what I like about this um, artificial stupidity because uh, everything which is like stupid or not stupid, I mean, it basically comes out of, of, of us, of humans, we create it. So it's our own stupidity we put into it. So it's my own stupidity I put into this um, robot. But because of them, we would also know um, um, AS uh, exist. And um, for instance, a vacuum cleaner is one of the um, artificial, uh, uh, not AS, IA, sorry. Um, or like a fridge even, is also this kind of uh, robot, which uh, we start to become very stupid because we forgot how to ferment or how to survive. in. In, in life when, when your fridge um, goes uh, yeah, breaks down and then um, like all these old traditions are uh, getting lost so this is basically I put these things a little bit upside down and the other way around and for me also humor is a big part it's very important for me because when you when you start to laugh about something, so you consciously or unconsciously uh, understand what what the meaning is. is. But these are like um, two big parts of it, and I always then create environments. So it's not just like I put these things on a nice pedestal, I always build a, a landscape or even and here in terrestrial assemblage, um, I started then to make my own pond in the pond, in like in order to to get this kind of idea, because you had to walk a very long way to to reach this pond, and if you were unlucky, you got um, wet feet, <laughs> because the um, the rubbers, uh, most of the rubbers were broken at the yeah, floating university. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But you had to walk a very long way until you basically reached this kind of very poisonous, green, shiny pond. And um, yeah, and this is what I really like to, to do. I, I like to create environments. Yeah, it's, um, 
big part of my work. Yes. And Duki, there is one thing that I feel we have left out so far mm. that is in your roles in life, that is the scuba diver, free yeah. diver. And yeah. actually, this, you're trained as a professional free diver, yeah. scuba diver and rescue diver yes. as well, right? Yeah. and deep diver. And deep diver. So yeah. you, you have a very physical engagement with uh, these, eco these marine ecologies that you yeah. bring into your work as well. And yeah. For example, I'm thinking about Ziggy and the starfish. Yeah, Ziggy and the starfish this is a long research project I did in 2016. And it was in this very special area in the Basque which is called Sumaya. And this is where the last asteroid hit the earth and you can see in every vertical rock layer the iridium of the asteroid and this is basically the proof of how um, the last extinction happened and which is really amazing and so I went there I did all this kind of geological research with the geologists biologists and um, also a very yeah amazing Yeah, person who um, uh, who is called uh, who is um, Miren Karajewer. She has a very complicated name, and she is an experimental marine biologist in um, in sexuality of how fish and uh, clams change the sex um, through endocrine disruptors. And um, so I had these conversations and meetings with her and. Um, We started the research about it. I went uh, every day diving, but I was looking into the adaption of the sea animals and how they also changed their, um, their sexuality through different kind of, uh, yeah, of the endocrine disruptors, but also of um, natural uh, resources and. Um, das endokrine System, weißt du, das, das Innere, also das ist ein, ähm, ho Hormon der Hormonhaushalt sozusagen. Ja. And, um, Hormonhaushalt, das ist yeah. <lacht> And this is basically, um, you have these substances, they can change your, your hormonal um, yeah, body situation and You have it on, like in chemicals, you have it in the soap, you have it on the TPC, you have it, so it's basically everywhere. And But this is also like just, we should not see it as a threat or as something like unnatural because it became so natural because we are here, we have all these uh, yeah, resources and uh, materials, we, we live here, so we have to basically embrace it that maybe a part of us is out of plastic maybe a part of us is not out of plastic or like always this kind of um, conversations you have but it's like it's it's here so and also this is also like changing our our life and, and the amazing part like with the sea animals they change the sex uh, through this situation, but they also just like change the sex because uh, they want to change the sex. Uh, it's like they don't have like any um, like hard thinking of it because um, it's maybe more easier if like uh, the most well-known thing is like that the male um, seahorse deliver the baby so the The female comes, put the eggs inside the back of the male seahorse, and so the seahorse brings the baby. Why not? Yeah? Or there's like um, sea slugs, which are really amazing. And you have this penis fencing dance. They're both uh, hermaphrodites, and they have this penis growing out of the head and then they start like to to fight and to like like to fence with their penis until one gets stuck and then this one has to deliver the baby and then <laughs> yeah and then there are like other uh, amazing uh, 
yeah, animals like the um, Argonaut who shoots their penis projectile through the water and he sees like 100 meters away the female and then he shoots his penis and then the penis goes through the water and then, yeah, he got the male, uh, the female, yes. For instance, also corals, how can they spawn? Because you think they are they are not alive, but they're very much alive, and they but they sit on the on the rocks and but they release sperm and eggs at the same time, and then um, it goes through the water, and then the egg and sperm they meet somewhere, and then they drop down, and a new coral starts to exist. And there's also like this uh, really nice uh, story of uh, Ovid from um, the Metamorphose. He um, basically wrote this uh, really nice story how the red corals started to, to evolve and this comes from Perseus who wanted to free, um, um, what's her name? Andromeda, yes, and uh, he started to uh, slaughter the head of Medusa and um, and then the blood went basically down into the sea and it's also like the stone and then um, from that appeared also Pegasus, the flying horse and the, the rest of the blood drops went into the sea and from that the red coals started to, to evolve. So there's all this kind of really nice stories about it. But for me it was more interesting the part that um, the marine life and all these little animals and creatures are much more adaptable than we are and there's so much going on and uh, which we can't even imagine what's what's um, what's happening there and I wanted to uh, yeah I wanted to make this visible through this film I made Ziggy and the starfish but I also created a, a form of how to show it so I made this big waterbed with six to eight meters big and you could basically walk up the stairs and dive into it and we were laying on the waterbed and on the um, top of the ceiling there was the film screened and you became one with the fish and uh, you had this feeling of being inside the water because with the water bed you're also losing the pressure and the weight of your own body which I wanted to make it visible because the nice thing by, by diving is that here on, on earth we have only a two-dimensional feeling of our body but the moment you start to dive professional or not professional, you go into the sea and you dive, you, if you dive five meters down, you, you start to feeling the pressure on your joints, on your lung and on everything. So this is the moment when you can experience a three-dimensional being. And this is really amazing. Also your heart rate goes down and but the fact of um, doing or diving as, uh, as an apnea diver, a free diver, this is a sense of, of or state of mind. So you think maybe you can't breathe, but um, the moment you start to go down, you become very um, yeah, calm and your heart rate goes down and uh, it's a state of meditation which is really amazing. The moment you get calm you, you can like dive for, not for hours, but for minutes. Yeah. And this idea of apnea or breathing is also very present in your, uh, in your work, at least uh, lately. I remember I saw at the uh, Betania, at the uh, Kunsthaus Betanien, yeah. you had this uh, beautiful work, that I forgot the name, about uh, this Vipassana uh, yeah. mattress. Yeah. What was it called, the work? It was um, Atmospheres of Breathing. Atmospheres of Breathing, yes. so, thanks. And uh, you had built this uh, alone, I guess. It was your uh, yeah. your machine of yeah. artificial stupidity yeah, yeah. that, at the same time, was very very smart. 
was this mattress, right? It was breathing together with you when you sit, sat on it at a vipassana yeah. moment, vipa vipassana rhythm. Yeah, and you could then watch uh, this two, um, two screen, two channel BTR made, um, staying with the trouble, and next to you, um, in front of you, had the six balloons, six inhaling and exhaling balloons, and then the other machine, which was connected to the mattress, and And then this was uh, connected to LEDs of the sea cucumber because sea cucumber is actually also um, uh, can live for eternal times and um, until you um, kill it. So everything was basically uh, connected in, in the same breathing movement and also was a manipulation, of course, because uh, I forced the viewer to to breathe in this rhythm as well, yeah, and, but it was really like, yeah, it was really like a meditative um, space, it was, yeah, I'm always, yeah, um, surprised how calm you get when you're, when you're in it, and you hear this You can um, also see this on my website. There's like all the documentation and the links for, for the video to see this works. Maybe you can also share with us some uh, some links to, to see the videos. Yes, I yeah. can. Maybe like we can watch them in the next uh, in one of the next uh, classes as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can send you some yeah, more city and the stuff things and. Uh, like this breathing atmosphere. I mean, most of them are short documentation videos. And this uh, documentation that you take of the underwater uh, life, do you do it? Is, yeah. Do you film it? Or, uh? Yeah, I film it, but uh, then I also like, uh, when I make this longer video pieces, like Siggy and the Starfish, uh, I also use found footage. Mm. But this is very much incorporated into my work. Yeah. So there's a big visual research. So we already have like a gigantic um, archive of yeah, of found footage materials. Yeah. And uh, Duki, you you are working or you were working two years ago, I remember, uh, on uh, or three years ago, 2019, on making kin for uh, this uh, theater. It was a theater piece that you were doing the scenography, right, for uh, Donna Haraway, yeah. Staying with the Trouble. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was in, uh, was at uh, Zitadelle Spandau, and I don't know why, why they came up to me and asking me to do that, and then apparently everyone... Uh, connects me with Donna Haraway, and I'm like, no. <laughs> but your work, in a way, your work is already connected with, uh, with these ideas of entanglement, yeah. making kin. Yeah. And, uh, no, I mean, but yes, yeah, so since then, I think everybody connects with Yeah, you. it's crazy. With, uh, with that book. Yeah, so you have to be very careful what you're doing in life. Huh? It goes really quick. They put you into <laughs> something. Into a box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, since we won't probably have the chance to see the exhibition Terrestre Lessenblech. There is a one, a big show I'm working now. It's a, my solo show at Urania. Urania is in the west of Berlin. It's for, well, you probably know this um, um, space. And um, the show opens up on the 16th of July and it's called Der Wurm, Terrestrisch, Fantastisch und Nass. So terrestrial, fantastic, and wet, and it's it's all about the warm, and it's it's a it's a space where you can experience to be a warm, and it starts from the outside with uh, into the wild, that's the table because of also like warms are essential for our being here. Without warms, we wouldn't be the same, and. Um, And we are very like entangled, um, and so that why into the wild has to be the first point 
because you have the soil and the vegetables and everything which grows and the worms they basically give the base for for the soil and for everything so you see it from outside and then you go inside urania and in the second floor it already starts with a huge um, gigantic warm tunnel so you go and you walk through the intestine of the worm and then you enter the belly of the worm and this belly of the worm will be entire dark and it will only um, work with black light you get the torch and you can then um, experience all the different kinds of worms and which is um, there's also sound uh, sound composer which I'm working now together it's Sasha Pereira she's an amazing performer she yeah. will also make live performance yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so she will make the sound for it, and you, yeah, so you you can then experience the the warmth itself. But you become basically they are gigantic, and you are somehow little. Yeah, that's different. And then from the belly of the warm, you get into the third room, and this is the wet room where the video projection will be of the warms and all kind of different wet sculptures and mycelium space sit, um, situations and then from there you go out so it's it's a huge space yeah so this you can definitely we see can go together. i would so love now. to when is it yeah. uh, when is it opening it's on the 16th of <coughs> july ah yeah the seminar ends on the 14th ah, ah. ah. <laughs> but you can go <laughs> we can go independently yeah. we can see if we can exactly. organize it as an extra yeah and then i have a few talks um i have a talk with uh, mark benecke maybe you know him he's this kind of really funny crazy um, pet, um criminal pathologe um a criminal pathologist Pathologist. Pathologist. Pathologist, yes. And um, yeah, so we will talk about dead bodies and maggots and worms. <laughs> and he's also, he's really well known, so which I really like that uh, I could uh, manage to get him on board. So I will have a talk with him. Mark Benecke. Yeah. And then the second talk will be with Bonaventure Nidikung. And uh, so I will make him to a warm expert. <laughs> and then the um, third um, talk will be with, oh, I forgot her name, but she's also a biologist. I really, uh, sh she did this really nice talk on, you can see it on YouTube, but um, my brain is a little bit, of, I forgot her name, I have to check on it. And Bonaventura, for those who don't know, is the founder and the director of the Savvy Contemporary, which is a, maybe everybody knows actually who Bonaventura is. Yeah. Here. So, yes, and then um, we have two live performances with Sasha Pereira. Mm. Yeah. And it will be all in Urania? Yeah, everything will be at Urania, yes. Yeah, and... Um, yeah, so we're making posters and flyers and banners at the moment. <laughs> and there are QR codes, and from the QR codes you can, um, can book your spot. Because everything you have to book online nowadays. So. Yeah. Difficult to be spontaneous these days. Yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> <laughs>